for our uh, speaker this week. It's a privilege to have Dr. Lon Solomon. He's the senior pastor of the McLean Bible Church in uh, Vienna, Virginia. Uh, Lon was born and raised in a Jewish home and in college life was uh, uh, in pursuit of a relentless uh, search for meaning and purpose, seeking to fill that void in a variety of avenues, including drugs and alcohol, partying, and even religion. But in 1971, in the midst of that turmoil, he met a street evangelist who introduced him to Jesus Christ. And that resulted in his decision to respond in faith to Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Messiah. Dr. Solomon holds an MA in Near Eastern Studies from John Hopkins University, a degree in Old Testament from Capital Bible Seminary, and a Doctorate of Divinity from Liberty. He served as a senior pastor of McLean Bible Church for over 35 years, and in 2002 was appointed by President Bush to serve in his administration as a member of the President's Committee on Intellectual Disabilities. He served two terms in that capacity. Lon is married to his wife, Brenda. They have four children and eight grandchildren. Their youngest child, Jill, suffers from severe mental retardation and physical disability. She's 24 years old and lives with Lon and Brenda where she requires 24 hours, seven days a week of care. And she's the inspiration for a house on the property of the church called Jill's House, an overnight respite center in Tyson's Corner, Virginia for children with disabilities and access ministry, a holistic and a multi-programmatic ministry at McLean Bible Church for children and young adults with disabilities and their families. It's been a wonderful outreach of ministry. He would not tell me this unless I ask him, but somewhere between 12 and 15,000 people uh, are in attendance or listen to him on a weekly basis as God has blessed his ministry over the years. He's a dear friend, and uh, Lon, it's great to have you back at DTS. Would you welcome Dr. Lon Solomon? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. good morning. Hey, it's great to see you guys. Last time I was here, uh, to speak was in 06, and you were over in that dingy old building. What's the name of that thing? Schaefer Chapel. Yeah, Schaefer Chapel. No, no disrespect to Dr. Schaefer, intended. But wow, this is much nicer. I like this. All right, where's my good friend Rick Taylor? I heard he was here. Rick, come on up here and give me a hug, man. God bless you, man. You, hey, man. it's great to see you. Looking forward to this. It's great to see you. All right. We go all the way back together to teaching at Capital Bible Seminary before he came here, but then he went on to get a double doctorate and all this stuff. I have no idea what he's talking about anymore. So anyway, um, we're going to open the Word of God, so why don't we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we commit this time in the Word of God to you, and we pray, Lord Jesus, <clears throat> that you would set this time aside for you to speak to our hearts. Father, we ask you, to illuminate our minds and our hearts that we might understand the Word of God by the power of your Spirit. And we pray against the enemy here in the name of Jesus. And we pray that you would grant him no entry to this place. Lord, we say that you would uh, tell him to be gone. This is not his seminary. He has his seminaries, but this is not one of them. And Lord, we pray that you would grant that only the Holy Spirit himself would be free to move among us with power and with freedom. Lord, I pray for myself that you would give me unction to preach the word of God today. Lord, anoint my heart and my voice and my mind and my spirit and enable me to teach the word of God with passion and with conviction and with purity and holiness the way it's supposed to be preached. And grant when we walk out of here, Lord Jesus, that we would not say today we went to chapel. No, 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 no. But we would say today that we met the living Christ in his word and in personal experience. And he touched our life and challenged our hearts. Oh, Jesus, deliver us from distractions right now. And may our full time and attention be focused on you and your word to our hearts. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I am here for the expository preaching series. And so I thought 
that not only would I try to give you uh, a great expository message every day, I'm going to try to do that, but also that I would take five minutes at the beginning of each of our chapels and do a little quick tutorial on what God has taught me over 40 years of preaching about expository preaching. And so uh, every day we're going to talk about something a little different. Today, <clears throat> I want to talk to you about why expository preaching. Now, I make a distinction between expository preaching and exegetical preaching. They don't automatically have to be the same. Of course, we know exegetical pre preaching is pulling the meaning X out of the text instead of eisegesis, reading the meaning into the text, which a lot of people do. But you know, you can do topical preaching and you can still make it exegetical. I'm talking about expository preaching, which I believe has as its unique component that we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, through the Word of God. And <clears throat> the reason that I am so um, committed to expository preaching is because uh, of our own human weakness. I don't care who you are or how much you try, every one of us has our own theological hobby horses. Every one of us, every preacher, every Bible teacher has those topics that are especially dear to their heart. And it could be obedience to God, it could be repentance, it could be God's sovereignty, it could be um, stewardship and giving, it could be personal holiness, it could be five-point Calvinism, uh, God help that church, it could, be, <clears throat> it could be the free will of man, God help that church, it could be Israel, it could be salvation, I don't care what it is, it could be anything, but you know those kinds of preachers that you wind them up and you start them anywhere. I don't care what book you start them in or what passage you start them in, they're going to end up right back on their hobby horse. And this is not good for the people of a church. The people of a church need a balanced diet. They need uh, meat. They need potatoes. Sometimes they need apple pie, and sometimes they need liver. <laughs> and, and it's just the way it is. And the only way to guarantee that our people get that is to preach through the Word of God, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, and uh, be careful that you preach the passage. You preach what's in the passage. You don't read your hobby horse into the passage, you, are, uh, you have enough intellectual honesty and enough theological capability, because you've been to Dallas Seminary, that you know how to pull the true meaning and the point out of that passage, and you know how to preach the passage. And if you do that, you will end up, because the Word of God is written this way, you will end up talking about stewardship, you will end up talking about obedience, you will end up talking about personal holiness, you will end up talking about salvation, maybe even five-point Calvinism, but you'll end up <laughs> talking about all of these topics, but not week after week after week. And you'll give your people the kind of balanced diet they need in order to grow into fully mature Christians. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? You get that? So whether you go out of here to be a preacher, whether you go out of here to be a Bible teacher, whether you go out of here to lead community Bible study, whether you go out of here to teach a Sunday school class, whether you go out of here to lead teenagers, it doesn't make a bit of difference. Folks, the best way, I'm convinced, to preach the Bible is to do it verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And we're going to talk later this week in another one of these five-minute tutorials about how to know what to pull out of the chapter and how to use it. Because sometimes you can pull five different things out of the same passage. How do you know which one to use and talk about? We'll get to that. But in the meantime, now listen, let me just say in closing this out, I'm not against topical preaching. You understand what I'm saying? 
I do it sometimes. You have to every once in a while. I'm just saying as the steady diet for your people, do the word of God verse by verse by verse, and God will bless your ministry. I remember when W.A. Criswell, y'all know that name? Yeah, y'all are in Texas. All right. I remember when W.A. Criswell first came to First Baptist of Dallas, they asked him, how are you going to preach? He said, I'm going to start in Genesis, and I'm going to go verse by verse to the book of Revelation, and then when I finish, I'm going back to the book of Genesis, and I'm starting over. And his deacons told him, they said, that won't work. Everybody will leave the church. Nobody will come here for that. Well, 40 years later, he had thousands of people coming there for that. Don't you let anybody tell you that. You preach the Bible verse by verse with the power of God's Spirit, and people will not only come back, but they'll be the better off for it. All right? We good? We good. All right. Now, let's do that <clears throat> in the rest of the time that I have. You know, I was at my... Um, 50th high school reunion this past weekend. I'll save you the trouble. I'm 68. Okay, now pay attention. All right, pay attention. All right, now listen. I was at this reunion, and, um, and, and I'm Jewish, of course, and I was, there was about, uh, I don't know, about 10% of my graduating class that was Jewish, and so it was really an interesting, uh, from, I graduated from Woodrow Wilson High School, Portsmouth, Virginia, and it was really interesting to go back and uh, see everybody, and they even gave me a chance, this was wonderful, to share my testimony as part of the official program of the reunion. I've never heard of that, um, neither at some of the Jewish people there. And so, <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't the big, you know, wasn't, but we did it. And I had about 15, 20 people in that meeting pray to receive Christ and gave away my testimony CDs. It was wonderful. But anyway, if somebody asked me, hey, do you still have any relatives who live here in the, in the, in the Portsmouth, Norfolk, Virginia Beach area? And I said, well, I've got a cousin and an aunt and a second cousin who lives somewhere. I don't know where he lives. But I said, I haven't talked to them in over 40 years. And they, they said to me, well, you know, don't you think you should make contact with them? And I said, you don't understand. I do make contact with them. I've written them letters. I've made phone calls to them. I've sent them emails. These people have not talked to me in 40 years since the day I showed up and shared Christ with them on their doorstep and told them that even though they were Jewish, without faith in Jesus Christ, they were going to hell. That's the last time we spoke. <laughs> Not lying to you. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about suffering reproach, suffering rejection for the name of Jesus Christ. And it comes out of a verse-by-verse -verse study that we're doing at McLean Bible Church right now in the book of Acts. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 5, but let me give you a little bit of background. Remember, the apostles were preaching and healing and uh, witnessing for Jesus in the streets of Jerusalem, so the high priest had them arrested, and he, put, he brought them before the Jewish council, and he said to them, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name, that is the name of Jesus, to which Peter replied, yeah, y'all told us that, all right, but we must obey God rather than men. Praise the Lord. Hey, praise the Lord. And that's where we pick up in Acts chapter 5. Here we go, verse 33. And when the high priest and the council heard this, they were furious and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee on the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up, and gave orders to put the men, that is the apostles, outside. Now this was Rabbi Gamaliel II. He was the most uh, prominent rabbi alive in the days of Jesus, and his name actually appears again in the New Testament in Acts chapter 22 when the apostle Paul was making his personal defense before the people on the temple mount. Paul said, verse three, I am a Jew 
born in Tarsus, but brought up in this city, Jerusalem, and strictly educated according to the law of our fathers under who? Say it. Gamaliel, that's right. This Gamaliel was the actual man who mentored and taught the Apostle Paul as a young Pharisee as he grew up in Jerusalem. Well, Gamaliel said to them, men of Israel, take care what you do with these men. Some time ago, Thutis arose, claiming to be somebody, and a group of 400 men joined up with him. And he was slain, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean arose and drew away some people after him. He also perished, and all those who followed him dispersed. Now, we don't know anything about this Thutis fellow, but we do know from Josephus, the famous Jewish historian, a little bit about Judas the Galilean. We know that he gathered a little army around him, that he refused to pay his taxes to Rome, <clears throat> and that the Roman government captured him and killed him and dispersed his followers. We also know from Josephus that his followers went on to become the party in Israel that we know as the Zealots. These were um, crazy, ra um, radical um, opponents of Rome, and there was even a small group within the Zealots called the Sicarii, based on the Latin word Sicarus, which means a dagger, who would try to find Roman officers or soldiers by the onesies or the twosies and assassinate them right there on the streets of Jerusalem. We know one of these guys, one of these zealots, because he was one of the disciples of Jesus. What was his name? This is Dallas Seminary. Come on, what is it? what's wrong with you? What is his name? Simon the zealot, right. And he came to Christ and decided instead of, ki instead of killing Romans, he was going to try to reach people for the Lord. Okay, so let's go on. Gamaliel is still talking here. He says, so in the present case, I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan be of men, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. And you may even be found to be fighting against God. So they took his advice, and after calling the apostles back, they flogged them. Now stop for a moment. You guys see The Passion of the Christ? You saw the movie, right? You know when they beat Jesus up just before they took him to the cross, they beat him to a bloody pulp? You remember that? That is flogging hitting him with rawhide strips that had pieces of metal and pieces of bone in it. And you saw what it did to him in the movie, right? That's what they did to the apostles. They took Gamaliel's advice to leave these guys alone and flogged them. Can you imagine what would have happened if they hadn't taken Gamaliel's advice? They flogged them even with his advice. And the Bible says they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then release them. And they, then the apostles, went from the presence of the council. What's the next word? Say it out loud. Rejoicing. Rejoicing. What is this, crazy? These people crazy? You get flogged and you leave getting flogged rejoicing? Who does something like that? This is crazy. Why in the world would you leave rejoicing? Look what the Bible says. They left rejoicing. Why? That they were accounted worthy to suffer reproach. The Greek word means to suffer disgrace or shame or humiliation in the name of Jesus. Last verse, and I love this, and every day in the temple and from house to house, look at this, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Messiah. You got to love these guys, don't you? Yeah, praise the Lord, right? Can I get a witness or anything in you guys? All right, come on now. All right, now that's the end of our passage, but we want to stop now and we want to ask our most important question. And you're going to learn this question this week 
because we're going to yell it every single day. But can we kind of give them a hint of what it is? Can you put it up on the screen? Okay. So when I say three, this is what we're all going to yell. We do this at McLean Bible Church, and you're not above it as seminary students. So are you ready? Come on now, nice and loud. One, two, three. That was awful. One, two, three. Better. All right. You say, Lon, so what? Say, I appreciate the passage. I appreciate the story. I'm sorry they got flogged. God bless them. What difference does any of that make to me? Well, that's what I want us to talk about in the time we have left. Do you remember when the Apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus? And when the Lord appeared to him, he became blind. And so then the Lord sent a disciple from Damascus, a guy named Ananias, to go and restore Paul's sight. And the Lord said to Ananias, Acts chapter 9, verse 16, he said, for he, the apostle Paul, is a chosen, uh, rather, forgive me, a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must, what? Suffer. Suffer for my name. Now listen. God is not talking here about the Apostle Paul's salvation. If you remember in Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer came and said to Paul, Sirs and Silas, what must I do to be saved? Paul didn't say anything to him about having to bear Jesus' name anywhere. Paul didn't say anything to him about having to suffer for Jesus' name anyway. All he said was, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. That's all it takes, wax on, wax off, period, right? But we're not talking about that here. We're talking about Paul now going beyond that and becoming a servant of Christ, a 100% sold out, committed servant of Christ, and God says if he's going to do that, then not only is he going to bear my name, but he's also going to suffer for it. That is the cost of bearing my name as a servant. Now, we understand this. We live in America. We understand that you can be an American citizen and not be a Marine, right? We got that. Any Marines here? Who are y'all? All right, there you go. Good. All right. We understand that. If you want to be a Marine, it's going to cost you something extra. And as God said to the Apostle Paul, Paul, if you want to be a casual Christian and just get into heaven and that's it, fine. But if you want to be 100% sold out, carry my name and serve me in an absolutely committed capacity, it's going to cost you something extra, Paul. You're going to have to suffer for my name. Now, you know, the Bible reiterates this truth over and over and over again. In Philippians 1.29, the Apostle Paul said, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to what? To suffer for his sake. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says, Indeed, all, look at this, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Peter said, 1 Peter chapter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you as though some strange thing were happening to you. Peter says, suffering is not for a Christian. It's not, it, sh- it shouldn't be a surprise. He goes on to say, but rejoice that you're partakers of Christ, what? What is it? Sufferings, yeah. That you may also be glad when his glory is revealed. And finally, Paul said to the Thessalonians, for you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Judea, Jerusalem, for you, what? Suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. But let no one be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that it is to be our lot for 
when we were with you, Paul says, there in town, we told you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and as you know. By, uh, friends, the point is this. The Bible says that suffering and persecution and paying a price for our faith is a normal, natural part of being a committed follower of Jesus, and Jesus himself said that. He said, John 15, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Remember the word I spoke to you, Jesus said. You're gonna need it to remember it. A servant is not greater than his master. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you if you stand for me. Now, this biblical truth is about as popular in the modern day church as a root canal. You with me? But I'm telling you that this is just a mu as much a part of biblical truth as the deity of Christ. And why will the world hate us? Jesus told us. They will treat you this way, Jesus said, because of my name. Because, watch, they do not know the one who sent me. The Bible says the people who will hate us if we stand for Christ are spiritually dead people. They are unregenerated people. And their unregenerated human nature hates holiness. It hates God and it hates his holiness. So when we identify with God, when we identify with his holiness, folks, it's not really you and me personally that they're hating. Unholiness hates holiness. And everything and everyone associated with it. That's why Galatians 5.17 says, for the desires of our sinful nature are against the Holy Spirit. And the desires of the Holy Spirit are against our sinful nature. Look, these two forces are intrinsically in opposition to one another. So can we summarize? Is that all right? Can we summarize? What the Bible is saying is that you put somebody who is living in their sinful human nature because they have no choice, because they don't know Christ, and you put them next to a follower of Christ who is living a conspicuous and outspoken life for Jesus, the Bible says there's going to be animus. There's going to be conflict there's going to be reaction and friction, and it is inevitable. Inevitable. And it doesn't matter how nice you are. Be as nice as you want. It doesn't matter how polite you are or how many times you say please. It doesn't matter. Folks, you tell people the truth about the gospel. You stand for personal holiness and purity in your life, and people are going to react. I mean, you tell somebody that they're a sinner in the sight of a holy God, and you tell them whether they're Jewish, whether they're Muslim, whether they're animal, vegetable, or mineral, it don't matter. You tell them that they're going to hell, and you tell them that there's nothing they can do about it, that only trusting what Jesus did on the cross for them can save them, and there's going to be blowback. Just get ready. You tell your boyfriend or your girlfriend that the sex has to stop and you are liable to lose a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Might be the best thing ever happened to you. Um, you, tell, you tell your friends and your coworkers that you're tired of the dirty jokes and you're tired of their lewd comments and you're tired of the filth that comes out of their mouth around you and you don't want to hear it anymore. And they're going to ridicule you. They're going to mock you. They're going to call you church lady. They're going to call you holy Joe. They're going to make fun of you. Listen, you tell your boss you can't go along anymore with lying and deceiving the customers. And it's going to affect your job. You tell your children 
that you cannot condone them living any way they feel like living, but you confront them with biblical standards, and you're going to meet anger, and as they get older, you're going to meet contempt. And yet, when we look at the early believers in the book of Acts, isn't this exactly how they lived? Folks, these people came to Christ, and then these people got baptized, and then these people went public for Jesus. Everywhere they were, and with everyone they met, their stand for Christ was crystal clear, and they suffered for it, and they didn't care. Because for them, there was no turning back. For them, it was an honor to suffer for Christ. An honor to suffer for Christ. This is an apostolic lifestyle. And friends, this is what the Bible calls you and me to, an apostolic lifestyle. The Bible does not call you and me to an American lifestyle. The Bible doesn't even call you and me to an American Christian lifestyle. It calls us to an apostolic lifestyle. And Jesus, let me say in conclusion, is not looking for 007 Christians. You understand? He's not looking for CIA Christians. He is looking for apostolic Christians who are willing to go out and take a stand for Christ and be as nice about it as they can, but to understand they're going to pay a price and who, they, they don't care if they pay a price. And they're willing to pay any price. And they're honored to pay a price, whatever that might be. I'm honored that my cousins haven't spoken to me in 40 years. I'm honored that my aunt doesn't speak to me. I'm honored that half of my neighborhood, which is Jewish, turns the other way when I walk around the street with my daughter and even if I say hello to them, pretend like I don't even exist. I'm honored. My wife said, doesn't it ever bother you that half the neighborhood hates you? <laughs> and I said, no. I remember what Moish Rosen, the founder of Jews for Jesus, said. He said, it's okay to be hated if you're hated for the right reason. And to be hated because of my stand for Christ not only doesn't bother me, I am honored to be hated for that reason. I'd be worried if I wasn't hated for my stand for Christ. I'd wonder if it was really out there the way it ought to be. Folks, I'm so glad you're at Dallas Seminary. It's great. But if you go out and you take a stand for Christ, you better know what's coming your way. And if you think only Jews do this, you're crazy. Even y'all Gentiles do this. <laughs> it's true. The man who led me to Christ, and with this I'm done, was a guy named Bob Eckhart. He was a street preacher in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where I was going to school, UNC Chapel Hill. Yeah? No Tar Heels? <laughs> All right. All right, all right, I know this is Texas. Okay, so he led me to Christ. And then when, when I was in the process of coming to Christ, he said to me, now, Lon, listen. He said, you're either 100% in, or if you're not, don't get in. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, Lon, do you understand what you're going to face, particularly as a Jewish person, and from all your drug buddies and all your drinking buddies and all your fraternity brothers and all your girlfriends, you know what you're going to face if you come to Christ? It, you, you know, you're going to get all kinds of persecution and ridicule. So you're either 100% in, son, or don't get in. Because 50% Christians, God's not looking for. I'm glad he said that to me. Because it really helped me make my decision that once I was in, I was in. And friends, this is what I'm here to challenge you to do. I know many of you know Christ, maybe all of you, I don't know. But there's a difference between knowing Christ and suffering for Christ. There's a difference between knowing Christ and standing for Christ. There's a difference between knowing Christ and serving Christ and taking the blowback that comes from doing it. There's a difference between being a citizen of the kingdom of God and a marine for the kingdom of God. God's not calling you just to be a citizen. That's his mercy. He's calling you 
once you receive his mercy, to pay it back by being a Marine for Christ and taking whatever comes your way. And so when I was a brand new Christian, I was riding around. Uh, it's too long a story. But anyway, I heard this song called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. You know what? I didn't have any Christian, I didn't know any Christian music. I'm Jewish. We don't sing this in the synagogue. I have decided to follow Jesus. I don't know a Christian song in the world. So I'm listening to this song, I have decided to follow Jesus. And it said, no turning back, no turning back. Wow, I love this song. 45 years later, almost 46, this song still brings tears to my eyes because as a brand new follower of Christ who was taking it on the chin, folks, bad. I had to decide he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and bear it is not worthy of me. No turning back. And I, I learned this song, and I still sing this song as a testimony of what my life has tried to be for the last 46 years. I have decided to follow Jesus, and I'm not turning back. I don't care if nobody goes with me. And in those early days, believe me, nobody did, except my dog, uh, which I'll tell you about some other time. I want to challenge you right where you're sitting to bow your heads with me, or if you need the words, you can look. But I want you to make a commitment right now. I want, to, I want you to ask yourself a question. Lord, am I a Marine or am I just a citizen? Am I taking suffering for Christ somewhere in my life? Listen, folks, listen to me with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If you can't think of one area in your life where you're suffering for Jesus, something is wrong with your stand for Christ. You say, Lon, that is the most judgmental statement I've ever heard anybody make in my life. Well, you know what? That's what the Bible says, and I stand by it. So if you're not suffering for Jesus anywhere with your relatives, your friends, your boyfriend, your children, whatever, something's wrong with your stand. Because all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So you take a moment for self-assessment. And let's sing this song together. Here we go. Ready? Follow me. I have decided to follow Jesus. Come on now. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, the world behind me, the cross before me. Come on now, come on. The world behind me, the cross before me. Is that really true? Is that really true of your life? The cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Last verse, here we go. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Not your mother going. Not your friends going. Nobody going but you. But still, you're going to follow. Why? No turning back, no turning back. Okay, sitting here now quietly, I want you to make a commitment to the Lord that you mean business. 
And even if ISIS grabbed you and threatened to cut your head off on television, you, the last words out of your mouth would be Jesus Christ. And you would be honored to have them cut your head off for the Lord. Honestly, I'd love to go that way. Can you imagine meeting the Lord after they've cut your head off for him? That'd be awesome. But whatever. Now, as we close out, I'm going to ask you to do this. If you really mean business, I'm not, I don't care what your friends think. If you really mean business, I want you to stand and sing this last verse with me. Let's go. Stand up. And you know what? You could raise your hand because the last time I checked, you can still graduate from Dallas Seminary and raise your hand and worship. The last time I checked, you can put your fist up and say, Lord, I'm no turning back. Right? Right? Isn't that right? Do, 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 isn't that right? You can graduate with your hand up, right? Just, just, just don't move your mouth. Okay, here we go. Ready? Put your hand up. Let's sing to the Lord. Ready? I have decided to follow Jesus. Come on. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Where's the world? Where's the world? The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. Why? No turning back. No turning back. And what if nobody goes with you? Though none go with me. Come on now. Still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. What's my commitment? No turning back. No turning back. Amen? Amen. I think revival's happening at Dallas Seminary. This is good. All right, so listen. This week, you go out there and stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if somebody makes fun of you, somebody persecutes you, somebody rejects you, somebody blows back on you, you go out that afternoon and you get yourself a cupcake and a cup of coffee and you have a party and say, praise the Lord. I suffered for Christ today. And if somebody comes in, you know, invite them to join the party. Buy them a cupcake. Say, I'm partying. I suffered for the Lord today. Praise God. Praise God. Come on, praise God. Right. Have a great day. We'll see you.